way through virtual modalities. And I wish we could all be in person and give each other hugs and, you know, the, the old school way of connecting. But, um, you know, we have this instead, which is kind of lovely because we can all meet up here in this virtual space. I'm so excited to continue this um, series. Uh, we were doing it once a week and now we've, uh, you know, got about once a month and we're really focusing on some cooler and cooler topics, some really cool um, people as guests. And I think we've been kind of dabbling into this mental health space, which is something that I think is so um, undervalued and underrecognized um, in the Parkinson's world. And I've just been thrilled to be able to invite some of my heroes um, out there and, uh, um, and we've been able to connect uh, this way. So I'm excited to bring you Dr. Laura Marsh. Um, she's an amazing um, psychiatrist who has been a leader. Um, she's trained so many of our guests. Actually, um, Joel Mack has worked with her. Greg Pontone has worked with her. Um, a number of folks that we've brought to you. And if you haven't seen those videos, you can go back and watch them on YouTube. But we've um, really um, been able to um, uh, sort of see her work through the work of others that she's inspired. And uh, she continues to inspire us and work closely with us at the VA. Um, and she's a professor of psychiatry at Baylor um, in Houston, Texas. And also um, is uh, the executive director of the mental health uh, service line, I believe, um, uh, which is um, at the VA. So she works men mental health care line at the VA in Houston. Um, and uh, she is, works closely with one of the Patricks, which is um, one of the Parkinson centers of excellence out in Houston, Texas. And um, I am thrilled to invite her here. We're going to kind of um, learn about her passions. Um, she just has a, such a wealth of knowledge, not only in medicine, but she's also a musician um, and brings sort of an interesting kind of um, uh, been to a lot of her thoughts. And so we'll sort of um, dabble around. So we won't have a really fixed um, slate of topics. Um, we encourage you, if you want to hear about some topics um, in the mental health world, you can kind of put them in the chat. We'll try to get to some of them, but um, welcome, Laura. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, so your background, a little bit about your viola playing and what has inspired you <laughs> to work at the VA and do the tough work that you and I both get to do, which is, um, you know, sometimes battle some bureaucracy, battle some, um, you know, paperwork and uh, also fight <laughs> for our veterans and um, not only their health from a physical standpoint, but from a mental and holistic health standpoint as well. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And it is great to see folks. I, I know some of you out there, so it's it's also nice to see you. Um, uh, we are not doing slides today. We're just talking. Uh, we're, and I hope we're going to talk about you know how to uh, address your mental health issues. I, I hope to learn from you as well. That's right. This is... Um, and I'm going to start off with just saying uh, how I ended up at the VA, and it really has a lot to do with Parkinson's disease. And um, so, in fact, it's completely because of Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, when I was, uh, uh, before I moved to Houston uh, 12 years ago in 2009, I was at, um, I was in Baltimore, Maryland at Johns Hopkins, where we had a Parkinson's uh, Clinical Research Center, one of the Udall centers. And my job was um, directing the um, clinical research core. Uh, and we had a longitudinal study. We had Greg Pontone, we had Joel Mack there. They were, uh, but we were, um, and we, uh, one of my uh, projects uh, was a specific um, NIH funded grant called Mood PD or Methods of Optimal Depression Detection in Parkinson's. And the purpose of that grant was to help neurologists do a better job of identifying depression in Parkinson's disease. And in the course of this uh, uh, work, uh, we saw 250 patients with Parkinson's who actually entered and enrolled in the study. I realized that it's sort of like marital therapy. Um, you know, you, you have to work on yourself. You can't change the neurologists. And, and so instead of trying to change the neurologists, I, I realized I needed to change how I practice psychiatry. And, and, and then I was looking at this potential job here in Houston and uh, where I would be running an entire, you know, mental health care line, which we have a lot of people, there's Houston's a big city. Um, and uh, I thought, well, why would I want to do this? But there was one week I had uh, about 20 or 30, it seemed like hundreds of people with Parkinson's disease who had psychiatric problems and they were all getting referred to me. And, and I thought, this is not the way to handle um, psychiatric problems. We need to have more of a step care approach uh, um, where people can uh, address psychiatric issues um, in, in a different way. Um, but the answer is not to have everyone see a psychiatrist. There's so much more you can do 
uh, before you you have to get uh, to a psychiatrist. So I I looked at this as an opportunity to uh, instead of working with neurologists, which I had pretty much been doing exclusively, I I now work uh, largely with psychiatrists and and other mental health clinicians. And it's only in the last couple of years that our neurology and psychiatry uh, factions have been beginning to become more interleaved. So I feel like I'm, I'm a, it, it takes a decade <laughs> for changes to occur. But with um, with advocates like we have in, in Parkinson's, you all have been you all have made a huge difference in making sure that mental health stays on the radar. So I guess that's how I got here. Was was was. Uh, um, uh, was wanting to provide better care for patients who have Parkinson's and making sure that our psychiatrists and other mental health clinicians knew how to take care of those patients. I find that they still are, even our psychiatrists, they don't always know best how to take care of them. And it's taking more time to begin to get a cadre of mental health clinicians who really know about Parkinson's disease and know about movement disorders and, and, and so that they're comfortable and the patients are comfortable working with them. So we can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we could start with, um, it sounds like there has been issues and I know that a lot of people feel frustrated looking at, um, you know, the symptoms of, for example, depression, sometimes Parkinson's symptoms themselves, sometimes apathy, how can we sort of get a sense of when somebody, you know, actually has something that may um, be different than just the motor symptoms of Parkinson's? Maybe we can start there. Right. Well, I think uh, what's, what is um, important to remember is how frequently psychiatric problems do occur in, in, in individuals with Parkinson's. And what we, what we don't know is whether we can intervene earlier before they become sufficiently problematic. And, and so that's, I think uh, we wanna talk about some of those things that people can do to keep um, their um, health as, as good as possible. And I think that when I, I know that uh, uh, you've been um, working so much on sort of the whole health approach to care. And, and I think in, in general, we, we, what we call a healthcare system has largely been a disease care system. We are used to caring for people who are sick. And what we want to do is Take, uh, take an approach where we actually uh, focus on, on, on how to live with your condition or, and how to prevent you from having uh, sort of the, the, the potential complications. And I think when it comes to mental health, there's so much uh, one can do. Um, and, and I think this year in the with the last two years now with the pandemic, that's also brought home uh, how much all of us have to, to do that, how, how we need to take care of ourselves and you know, to whether it's walking or eating nutritionally or getting more sleep, which is something, you know, that I've been actually working on very diligently, not always succeeding, but things like this that we can all do um, that, that make a huge difference in terms of our well being. So, one is um, remembering that mental health conditions occur, mental health disorders occur um, in all kinds of people. But in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, you're especially vulnerable. And that's because of the nature of the, uh, of the brain disorder, the, of, the, of the neurotransmitters and the, the neurons and so forth that are not functioning anymore. And that those are, um, uh, those are systems that you know, uphold and stabilize and help you regulate your mood. They also help you regulate your thinking. So depending on where in the brain, you might have you know, uh, more or less Parkinsonian pathology. You might have um, anxiety, or you might have apathy, or you might have depression, or you might have trouble with your thinking or trouble with executive function. And, and, and being aware of all those possibilities of, of what can happen. And then um, working with someone or on your own trying to understand what that is. And, and the, the most important thing that patients can do is, is be able to talk to their clinicians and to say what kind of problem they're having and to, to delineate that as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, because there's always a broad interpretations of, for example, dyskinesias. There's a paper uh, on dyskinesias recently. It says, how do patients describe them? It's clear as mud. You know that uh, that everyone uses a different term, and so what what may be depression to you is actually you know anxiety to someone else, um, and each of those has a different treatment. So we have to really kind of know what all these different kinds of symptoms can be. 
So it sounds like, you know, from your perspective, um, the disorder Parkinson's has motor symptoms, but it's also very, very um, linked to mental health issues. Um, a lot of the times mental health issues tend not to be recognized because I think a lot of us are, you know, neurologists and we focus on motor symptoms and people think it's a neurological disease, but the mental health stuff is very common. It's also under identified perhaps, and it can sometimes be depending on how patients say these words and may not be able to clearly express sometimes exactly how they're feeling misinterpreted. And so maybe people need guidance on how to um, bring these issues up to their doctors and caregivers also maybe need some issues, need some help with guidance. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. And also I think there's a huge stigma, right? With um, getting the care. Um, I know that a lot of the times people are more comfortable talking about their motor symptoms because they feel like that's something that people can see sometimes, um, you know, that if otherwise it's all in their head and people may not believe them. So maybe we could talk, start maybe a little dialogue on how do we help patients to kind of, if they're feeling um, certain ways, um, let's say, you know, anxious or um, kind of, you know, blue, maybe we can use some of the words mm -hmm. that maybe um, easier for, for doctors to understand. How can we help them to then, um, you know, come to their doctor, maybe talk to them about that and then get the help they need. Let, let's sort of um, so, talk a little bit yeah. about that way. Well, I think the, the um, uh, uh, first thing is is um, uh, remembering that you know you have your usual self, <laughs> and 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 to remember what your usual self is. And often um, I look at uh, just say depression, where someone is typically um, you're able to enjoy certain things, certain things interest you. Um, it's not just about being happy because happiness is not really what we're aspiring to. What we what we want when we're healthy is a range of emotions. You want to be able to enjoy the things that are pleasurable feel sad for the things that are, are, are you know, make you feel sad. And, and when someone gets depressed or has a mood disorder, and we're talking about a mood disorder, we're not just talking about a reaction to something that where you have a short-lived uh, change in your mood. We're talking about sustained, uh, pervasive changes and how you respond to things. And so often um, what, what people will notice uh, is is when they finally get better, they say, wow, I really wasn't really enjoying anything. I wasn't interested in things. There's a sort of flatness to the world. The world looks kind of gray. Um, and when uh, and it kind of creeps up. And there's a tendency on most people's part to explain away why they feel that way. They say, well, I'm that way because I have Parkinson's. I'm that way because my wife is burdened by my care or my kids have moved away and they don't call enough or, or something. So there's always this explanation but before you get to one of those infinite possible explanations, because um, there always is, sometimes you have to consider, well, maybe it is a serious mood disorder where my mood, my, my brain's ability to kind of rally and provide bootstraps for me, because that's another way to look at it. So I, when someone is no longer having their bootstraps that helps them cope, or even as I would say to some, don't wait until you have no bootstraps. If you start to find that one of your bootstraps is slipping, um, then you need to be thinking, oh, is this something happening that may be related to um, my, my uh, uh, mood, mood syndrome? So I look at uh, really these mood symptoms in particular. Um, can I enjoy myself? Can I rally myself? Can I, um, do I have a sad mood or a more agitated mood? Do I respond to things in a way that I would enjoy them as usual? Some people say, well, I, I do enjoy having my grandchildren come around, but if you're only enjoying when your grandchildren come around and nothing else, that's a little too far gone. You, you know, we'd like you to have a little bit more going on in your life. So, so sometimes it's, a, it's these loss of things that creep in very slowly. And then there's the other things, feeling guilty about things you don't need to feel guilty about, feeling um, uh, you know, more tired, more fatigued than you would ordinarily feeling like you can't concentrate or think as easily as you could. Um, other kinds of um, changes in your self attitude, thinking that you're not good enough or that you're not valued by your family. And, and every person I know who has had Parkinson's and depression, who said, well, you know, I just don't contribute as much to my family anymore. And uh, I had a, a woman who said to me, she goes, you know, I if you were to ask a um, hundred patients with Parkinson's, she goes, I'm sure, everyone would say, 
there's just no reason to keep going. And I said, well, actually, I see hundreds of patients with Parkinson's disease. And all, the only ones who say that to me are the people who have depression. And, and when they're not depressed, they don't say that. And she did get finally treated. She accepted the treatment. And uh, I ran into her at one of the World Parkinson Congresses. And she's there like racing around and all the booths and so forth. And she goes, this is great. <laughs> you know, so, so I think that it's a, it's a difference between being you know, treated and not treated for it. Um, so those are the things in terms of a change from your usual person. Now, where it's tricky in Parkinson's is that a good 50% of people who get mood disorders, depressive disorders, may have actually had those episodes of depression before they even had Parkinson's disease. So that can be a little tricky because is it, we wonder, is that part of Parkinson's and its pathology that it's starting to change your mood regulation even earlier on uh, before you even know you have the, the motor symptoms. But um, in general, people will notice that there's a, a change and, and that's what you're looking at. Um, anxiety the same way. It becomes, uh, you know, where it's sort of a, a, a change in who you ordinarily are. Um, a, a good example is a patient I had who worked up in a, a cherry picker. Uh, and suddenly he goes into a bathroom uh, and he's a restroom stall and he starts having panic attacks. You know, this is a guy who's been in kind of little closed in spaces forever. And to suddenly have panic attacks beginning at age 54 is very unusual. Usually panic disorders and other anxiety conditions will begin early on in life. And we know that these anxiety conditions can begin. Um, uh, it can be like a, a a sign of changes in the brain chemistry and, and, and so forth. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'm gonna have to maybe make some people make some changes here. Um. <laughs> oh. I think she's just gonna, I, I think she's getting some work done. So it sounds like, you know, just to clarify, um, it sounds like there's um, some changes that can occur in the brain that cause, you know, mood symptoms, and they are part and parcel of Parkinson's. Uh, you know, we talk about 40% of our patients sometimes have anxiety, 40% of them have um, depression, 40% have apathy. These are very linked to the disease itself. And um, I was just saying how common uh, some of these things are in Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I think the other question is why is it then not recognized as, as often when someone goes to their um, neurologist um, and um, and you know, there's a lot of reasons for that and um, sometimes it's I think the big reason is <laughs> is the um, is is because the focus when you go to the neurologist is often on your movement disorder. Now, when I think about a movement disorder, I think about all the things that go with the movement disorder. I think about the mood, the cognitive, the motor, the you know various other you know gastrointestinal problems and so forth that people have. And that's um, but 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 the way uh, training has occurred has often been, you know, it's focused on you, you ask about the movement symptoms. You, you're not as comfortable. The clinician is not always as comfortable. And I think that you know there's there's a big movement uh, being forward where. Uh, we will, uh, where there will be more comprehensive care, interdisciplinary care, where um, different individuals will be working with you. But there's, but there's also things that you can do, uh, which is uh, uh, including, you know, whether that's a, um, uh, um, uh, you know, t having tracking yourself, there's mood trackers, there's other kinds of things that you can have that you can show if someone is concerned about what you're, uh, what you may be uh, talking about. So how do you get your doctor to, if you're seeing someone in a, in a, in a clinic, that, how do you get them to pay attention to your mood symptoms when they're mainly wanting to focus on uh, their, their, um, uh, their, your movement at a mouse? I'm going to ask you, uh, Indu, because you might tell me, what, what would you do as a neurologist? <laughs> well, I think we as a community have to realize that we have underrecognized this. And I think as, as neurologists, you know, we're usually trained on motor disorders and movement. We call it a movement disorder. So, um, you know, so I think so much of that, the words um, end up really pigeonholing us into what we think about. But I think that those of us who've taken care of patients for, you know, I've 
probably been a, a Parkinson's doc now for about two decades, we realized that the non-motor symptoms and the mental health symptoms are so important in terms of quality of life. And I think we've designed these scales historically to really focus on tremor and, you know, rate things around uh, motor symptoms. But I think when you really stop and talk to patients, what they're really talking about and their caregivers um, is, is really these sort of non-motor aspects. And unfortunately, we don't have necessarily as robust treatment sometimes. So sometimes when we don't have a perfect solution, we're like, you know, let's not talk about about that. Let's, you know, leave that to the last, um, you know, the next visit or whatever. But I think, you know, patients want to be heard. They want to be understood. They want education so that they can understand that this, this, they're not alone. And a lot of, I think even support groups are also spending a lot more time in this arena so that we can kind of destigmatize, hopefully some of the mental health, um, you know, aspects of this. And I think COVID and it's, you know, effects on us as even clinicians. I think many of us have realized that, you know, we're not sleeping when we're anxious, when we're uns- certain about the world when we're, you know, worried about our family members and their health. Um, you know, I think that we don't perform well, my mental state isn't good. I've not been able to, you know, be at the top of my game. Um, and so we really, I think we've really taken a new sort of page in the book of how can we really address these things? Um, and working together as multidisciplinary teams, I think is really the way. So, um, I may not have all the answers, you know, we can kind of get people help, uh, by just, hopefully having a conversation, starting something about, you know, yes, we understand this is common. Maybe I don't have the solutions. Maybe I don't have all the time in this visit, but let me plug you in with a social worker or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, um, you know, or these resources at, you know, um, the PMD Alliance or the Parkinson Foundation or whoever who may have more, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, some information at least. Cause I think a lot of the times when patients feel like they're alone, when people feel like they're not being heard, the communication ends up being poor. That's when I think we all get derailed. And then, you know, the trust is lost, the rapport is lost. And then, you know, people just feel like they're, they're not thriving is my sense. So I think when um, people can really, you know, feel like they can engage their clinicians, um, I think, you know, maybe taking in some literature from, you know, some of these organizations to say, this is common, you know, this is a symptom of my Parkinson's, could you help guide me? Would you be able to refer me to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, um, you know, because these things are really affecting my quality of life, you know, I think that's sort of where the conversation has to happen. And unfortunately, like you mentioned, you know, our healthcare system is not designed really to do this well, we um, you know, really are, are often in a situation where something really has to get spin out of control. And then we're sort of playing um, catch up or damage control. But my sense is, and Laura, you and I have talked about, you know, sort of the concept that, um, you know, can we try to have these conversations to equip patients, even from early in diagnosis, I think many of my patients um, if they had only realized how much, you know, they may have um, the ability to affect, you know, um, their own quality of life by choosing things every day that may help them feel a little bit more in control. Also to understand that, you know, it is depression and there may be um, help through, a, you know, a pill that may replace, you know, serotonin or um, other strategies. Um, you know, I think that they, they often have the information then to make these decisions. And some people decide, you know, you know, I, I really don't want to see a psychiatrist. I really don't want to take a pill, but once we've tried a few things and they've really sort of felt like they're being heard, then maybe that opens the sort of um, dialogue a little bit more. And often, you know, at the VA, for example, we're very lucky to have folks like um, you, Laura, or, you know, my um, uh, Dr. File sits alongside me at the VA and we literally are able to go in together and see patients mm-hmm. and then have a conversation and make sure that the medication that we're going to use, you know, to help their anxiety is not going to, um, you know, conflict with their Parkinson's medication. And so I think it it is sort of good communication. So that that's sort of my sense, but I, I, I'd love to hear from you. Well, I think that one of the things that people can do is start to look for um, uh, clinics where there is this interdisciplinary care so that you know that there are people thinking about these things. Um, And, and you can have, uh, you know, the psychiatrist spend more time with you. Uh, on uh, aspects of your your uh, mental state, and there's other I see in the chat. People are asking about other things besides mood problems, but um, uh, mood is something everyone agrees we have. <laughs> that um, so it tends to be something that is easier to talk about. Some of the other things that occur are much more more are, are even more challenging, and they can be downright you know bizarre and unexpected. When like for example, um, if you're hallucinating and seeing you know people that you didn't expect to see. So um, I think, again, I'm going to, what I'm going to, there's, if, if I were to give a recommendation, when 
when you start off having the condition, it's nice to know what all these possibilities are. Um, and for some people, it, that scares them. So people uh, are afraid, uh, some clinicians are afraid to tell patients because they say, well, if I do that, then they're going to really, that they're going to you know, uh, be upset and they'll be more worried about it. What I think is important if you know about it, and as a clinician say, these things can happen. I need you to be keeping your eyes and ears open for any kind of changes in you so we can address those um, because they are treatable and people can, uh, and, and people can function better. So uh, I, we're to kind of start at a, um, you know, sort of thinking about even wherever you are at this point in your Parkinson's course, to be thinking about where you are right now, and then what is it that you need to go forward and in terms of where you are in terms of your overall well-being and health, and, and taking stock of how you're doing with things. So if I look at mood, are you coping with things that you ordinarily would be able to cope with at least in a mental sense. Maybe you can't do everything in terms of, you know, carrying the groceries up the stairs or something like that. But you, but in terms of your your attitude, your uh, your resilience, your ability to, you know, deal with slings and arrows that occur in life. Um, and, and again, it doesn't mean that you don't have a sad moment or an upset moment or a concerning moment or all the other things or your kids aren't driving the nuts or something that they or they disappoint you. Um, but that you can, you can rally back from that. Um, and then if that's not, um, and, and when that's changed or you feel like your life is not worth living or you, um, uh, or you even worse that you should not be here at all, uh, then these are concerning, uh, changes that people can have. Um, I, um, I look also at this, these issues of anxiety, but also the cognitive changes that occur. And what happens is when we treat these conditions, people's Parkinson's gets better, their motor symptoms, as well as their cognition. So they, they come back, you know, uh, six months later and they're like, wow, I'm really doing great with this disease. I know what to do with it. And um, I had told him about a, 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 psych, a neurologist I worked with who I completely treated this, the, the lady's uh, depression. And he came up and goes, wow, she is doing so great, isn't she? And he took all the credit. Uh, but <laughs> and really all she needed was her, was her mood disorder treated. Um, but we, um, um, but the other part is even if you have mild to moderate depression, there's, there's things that you can do before you even need to take an antidepressant. Uh, and so I think that's what I, um, there's sort of healthy living in general. And then there's even, you know, really getting yourself to have that healthy living when you have a mood disorder. And what happens is some people, when they're, when, you know, when they, they don't want to do anything when they're depressed, they just want to lie in bed. They don't want to get out and, and having that, just kind of trying to get that momentum going where they have to become active. So having activities that are scheduled, getting out of the house, sometimes just you know, going to see the, 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 your clinicians, if that is, or going to your support group, scheduling things, trying to have, meaningful activities put into your life, putting scaffolding around you. Um, and, and then scheduling exercise, working to have that healthy diet, trying to get yourself into those healthy habits, which again, when you're depressed, you're not so inclined to want to do, but it is, if you can just sometimes think about one thing at a time uh, that you might do this week or this day and setting you know, very small attainable goals so that you can do that. Um, there are so many, um, uh, you know, people involved in, in breathing exercises or meditation or um, yoga or um, these kinds of practices are, are really, um, I think they're critical for health in general. They help to, if you have, if you're an anxious person, they, we already know that you know, when you, when you breathe, it helps you with your parasympathetic nervous system or your rest and digest system. So you're going to relax a little bit more. And when we talk with our patients with Parkinson's who take part in some of the cognitive behavior therapies, their favorite um, uh, uh, skill sets uh, involve breathing. Well, you know, breathing is something any of us can do. <laughs> and, uh, and I recommend it highly. Um, um, it's, um, because it's, it also is, um, you can use it in any moment when you're feeling worse, when you're apprehensive about something. And it just kind of recalibrates um, 
where uh, where your your brain is, and it 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 affects your brain neurochemistry. Um, I told uh, uh, the our, our hostess uh, before we got on. I had a patient when I was out in Palo Alto who was a very, very anxious patient. And what he would do when he would get anxious and he'd have these spells every day, like at 10 o'clock in the morning, he'd have these anxious spells, like panic attacks. And we talked about doing something that would relax him and it was somewhat repetitive. And what he liked to do was um, uh, sing karaoke. And he would sing like the same karaoke song. I'm sure he drove his whole, his whole family, you know, a uh, baddie. But he gave me this scarf, and this is over 20 or 30 years ago. So I decided I would wear this scarf in honor of him uh, today. I love <laughs> I'll let you see it better. It's got- Beautiful. I love it. We all have those patients that change our practice. I mean, we learn so much from you know, our patients and their, what works for them as well. So I right. think, you know, and sharing those strategies in, in this sort of support group, mm-hmm. you know, if, if people want to type in the chat, what makes them feel better when they're anxious, that would be, um, you know, awesome too. So, um, but it sounds like, so just to kind of, um, you know, sort of uh, like summarize, so making a schedule, trying to, you know, organize your day every day in some way to try to, you know, get up and get out of the house if possible, mm-hmm. you know, getting showered, you know, putting something on the calendar, maybe every day, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming. So something bite, like a bite-sized change. So let's say mm-hmm. today, you know, this week we're going to work on exercise. And if you are really not able to exercise very much, maybe walking five minutes even, or um, five minutes of trying some breathing exercise and, the, and there's some apps and stuff, but it sounds like exercise and trying to schedule that in, um, scheduling in maybe something in the mind body world. So breathing is something that um, I totally agree with, you know, that that can really reset sometimes when we're in sort of a, um, in our head with a lot of thoughts and some of the videos that we've done on this series um, have talked a little bit about that. There's a lot of breathing techniques in yoga um, and even meditation um, techniques focusing on breath. So definitely, I think that's exciting. Um, you also mentioned um, maybe socializing, finding people um, you know, in your community or, or a family member to sort of um, reach out to and check in with maybe, because um, I think I think many of us are, are, are seeing, um, and, and Laura, maybe you can comment on this, that, you know, feeling alone and isolated can really sometimes affect your mental health as well. Right. And you mentioned sleep and diet as two other things um, to focus mm-hmm. on as well. And some of these sort of um, approaches to sort of living, living better, living well, to sort of set the stage to help um, not only your physical state, but also your mental state as well. Real estate, right? And and I think that um, the part on on socializing, or at least you know, recognizing who your support people are. Several years ago, I came up with a little acronym. I was I was talking with a, a veteran who uh, was young, uh, uh, from uh, Iraq, and uh, come back, and he was he was um, uh, about thirty two years old, and he was uh, telling me about uh, the things that he wanted to do and how he couldn't do them. And, and then he was very, very anxious and he wanted to know, should I take this pill? Should I do this pill? Should I do this? I said, you know, here's the thing. I said, it's not just the pill you have to take. You have to, and I was thinking about him. He's a real hot mess. Um, and so I came to me, the, the little acronym that I use is mess. So medications, which is increase them, decrease them, get the right ones on, ones that you tolerate and will take, not ones that you don't take. Um, so up, down, get rid of, or add, um, and then, um, the next one is education. So M E education, learn about your condition, learn about your Parkinson's, learn about mood disorders or anxiety or psychosis, um, uh, coping skills. The, uh, the, the, the S is, um, skills. So skills are things that we often learn in things like cognitive behavior therapy or these practices like, like uh, how to relax or how to uh, have a, uh, the breathing exercises, but also skills for dealing with emotional distress. So there are um, uh, various uh, approaches, uh, like ex- what something called acceptance and commitment therapy, where uh, it's a very specific kind of psychotherapy where you are looking at things that are happening in your life and, and you begin to uh, adjust differently. There's other ki- kinds of approaches called problem solving therapy. And it's sort of hard to believe that you'd have to go take a, a class or learn this as a skill. But often when you're kind of living your life, you know, you don't think about, oh, I'm going to do problem solving therapy. Now you just kind of solve your problems as best you can. But there are people who've actually studied this and found that there are 
you know, scientific, a scientific basis for doing it this way and not sort of the old way that you <laughs> used to do them. And you can learn these skills and then you can apply them in your life. Um, and, and what's so neat about the Parkinson's field is that people like Roseanne Dobkin have taken these cognitive behavior therapy skills and then works on teaching those with to patients, but also with their family member or caregiver or whomever else is around that can support them in that. So that's the, the um, our, our occupational therapy, physical therapy. Those are also skills that people learn and, and you can apply in your life. So M-E-S and the last S is support. So mess. And if you don't get the full mess, you feel like a mess. So I was saying, you know, if you're feeling like a mess, think about it. Have you, have you addressed all the M-E-S-S and um, see if that is, is another way to, um, again, these are you know, kind of general ideas, but I think they, to me, they're, they're helpful uh, with you know, almost everyone in terms of a conceptualization, because what happens is with Parkinson's in particular, I always like to say it's such a, it's such a rich disorder. It's so complex and living with it is, you know, what do you think about? What do you, do, you, do you address this problem? Do you address that problem? There's so many different aspects that you can begin to look at that it can be overwhelming. And if you don't have a structure and, you know, even as you said, that with the, you know, make a schedule for your day, there is a need for scaffolding for your day. And there's a good reason why that's important in Parkinson's. And that's because of the kind of cognitive changes that occur in Parkinson's with that executive dysfunction, the, the, the kinds of changes that affect your ability to plan and to um, kind of do two things ahead of the time um, that you really, you don't want to have to spend your energy trying to figure out what you're going to do if you can just put it out and already have it done. Like if I'm going to get ready to go to work in the morning, I shouldn't have to make my lunch in the morning. If I have it all out, I don't have to think about it. So you want to get as many things as you can in your life that really shouldn't require your mental energy and put them um, and, and get them done or set up a structure so that things, you know, it makes, I, we say in, at work, make it easy to do the right thing and make it hard to do the wrong thing. So now I'm going to talk about some, some things that are really important, some things not to do. Um, and um, uh, as some of those are um, things that are, are dangerous, like things that put you in peril. So once you start having trouble with um, like walking and, and, and talking sometimes when, when you're having balance problems, that's the time you can prevent problems uh, from occurring by making sure that you're not putting yourself at increased risk of falls. So once you start having falls, you, there's a whole cascade of other things that happen. So it's really important to be thinking about what you need to do to keep yourself as, as, as safe as possible. Um, the... Um, uh, some other things that um, uh, that I guess I, that you should not do. Um, I, 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 it's easier. That's the one thing. Is basically be very careful when it comes. If you start having problems, with I know the other things. Don't get constipated. And someone's talked about that already. Uh, there is, uh, you, and you can do all kinds of things to keep yourself from getting constipated. So as a geriatric psychiatrist, the the most common things I do is not necessarily start an antidepressant. It's treat urinary tract infections, treat constipation, and keep people from falling. Um, so um, the uh, and the constipation is something that you can do you know, by drinking a lot. You can use a little bit of psyllium in your food. Um, having a nice uh, you know, every day having that gruel mixture of sort of um, uh, 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 it's um, wheat bran, unprocessed bran. Uh, uh, applesauce and prune juice. And you have a little compote of that every day. And lo and behold, you will become much more regular. And, and I have many patients who, have, who swear by that over the years. Urinary tract infections, if you're not constipated, you're less likely to get them. Um, we've got some people that are talking about um, uh, psychosis. And they're also, I think, talking about medications for depression. And I, I if, um, if, if you want, we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So maybe before we go there, so remember the mess thing. And I love that. Um, so I think a lot of what we do in, in the geriatrics world, 
um, in, in all sorts of worlds is, is take people off of medication. So it's really important to take in your current list of medicines, all your pill bottles, anything you're putting in your body, because um, you know, what we're talking about, um, with Laura here is that, um, you know, a lot of the medicines that sometimes we get, you know, over the counter, even like with Tylenol PM or something like that has Benadryl in it. There's certain things that we don't want to be giving, uh, to Parkinson's patients as they age. So, so definitely the medications, um, and I love the rest of the, the support. The last S is, you know, something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the skills and, uh, what was E one more time? Education, education. education. Which is absolutely what we're doing here. So empowerment, education, there's, there's nothing like yes. being knowledgeable about these things. So, so I love that. So yeah, let's spend a minute talking about, um, maybe we could talk briefly about psychosis, maybe even mention a little bit about impulse control issues. Cause I think these are two things that are in the psychiatry world, pretty big warning signs. Um, you know, I think that, that are big red flags. Um, maybe we'll, we'll talk about those and, um, and people are also talking about there are some medicines that should be avoided as well in Parkinson's patients. And so that's why I think, you know, if you're starting to have some of these issues, um, there's complexity, it's just really important to engage the right types of doctors. You know, if you have access to a subspecialty movement disorder neurologist and even a psychiatrist, um, you know, uh, definitely take the time out of your life. It's worth the drive or worth the Zoom visit if you can arrange it, you know, once a year to check in with somebody who may be a subspecialty let really go over those medicines, go over, um, anything that might've happened since the last year. Cause it's, you know, it is the, the, the knowledge base is, is ever expanding and it's hard for people, um, to keep up with everything, um, even just in Parkinson's, uh, by itself. So, um, so yeah, so why don't I let you talk a little bit about psychosis and, and, um, and impulse control issues, if you don't mind. Okay, so there's there's two kinds of psychotic symptoms in Parkinson's. There's hallucinations, which is basically a perception of seeing something, hearing something, smelling something, um, feeling something touch you when there's actually something that isn't there. And and people with Parkinson's even somewhat earlier on can have uh, experiences that we refer to as minor hallucinations, like they might see a shadow or uh, they might feel the presence of someone uh, near them, even when no one's there. Um, these are these can be kind of normal uh, experiences in anyone, but they tend to occur more in in uh, someone with Parkinson's. Um, and what I use those as is are sort of like a red flag. Oh, if that person's having them, the first thing I do is I look at their medications. I might check a urine to, to and constantly always look to see whether these little kinds of minor hallucinations are sort of creeping into that person's um, you know clinical picture. So always asking about them. It's, it is um, common to have, a, a, you know, maybe have a visual hallucination of something when you're waking up or hearing a voice when you're waking up or falling asleep. But in general, people with Parkinson's describe pretty consistent kinds of, you know, seeing a, a, a little girl sitting on the edge of the bed or, you know, something in the, um, you know, the, maybe a shape or something in the, in the bushes that looks like a bear um, and then when they get up close or something in the rug, and then it's, it's actually just the rug. It's not really a, a, a dog on the, on the, in the rug. Um, so again, always looking for those and asking about them. It's, it, at some point, they may not, you may not be able to be able to prevent them. But I've often found that if I uh, begin, they're, they're consistent with some changes in cognition, and I try to make sure, again, I've maximized how that uh, uh, person's medication regimen is and consider starting them on a medicine to help with cognition, like um, one of the cholinesterase inhibitors, or, um, but mostly getting people off of drugs. So I've, in addition to treating urinary tract infections, we also take people off of medicine. So if someone's taking Benadryl or um, uh, some of the medicines for urinary incontinence or a... Um, uh, Valium or Xanax or other medicines that are used to treat anxiety, those can often be associated with developing these kinds of, of uh, psychotic symptoms. There can be more serious ones where, where a person loses insight, they think someone's in the house, that person might be trying to harm them, or someone, as mentioned there, or someone can have um, threatening uh, 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 ideas or delusions, it's our, which are fix false beliefs uh, that someone has, no matter what the evidence is to the contrary. So there is a common uh, uh, delusion that people have in Parkinson's where, uh, and in other kinds of um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders where, where they believe that their spouse may be um, you know, seeing someone else, 
Sometimes it's also related to changes in, in recognition so that um, when someone is, um, you know, looks in the mirror, even like now, if any of us, you, you, you think you're like yourself when you were 30 and you look in the mirror and go, oh, well, who is that? You know? and, but so is there, sometimes it can be that as uh, we think this is related potentially to how people process spaces and so forth, and whether that's related at all to the paranoia that comes about with seeing that person in the household and, and, and perhaps processing who they are differently, maybe that's feeding into that. That's just a theory. But, but the important thing is, um, in, uh, in, in almost all cases, this has been something that is a delusion that, that you know, caregiver, that family member is spending all of their time with that, that individual. And it can be very hurtful for the spouse uh, to, to have someone saying that. And, and it's important. That's where the education, what we do mostly is we work with the, with the family member on how to, um, how to cope with that and how to, uh, as often people will say, meet the patient where they are. Uh, and, and, and we also treat that. And there are different medications that can be used. Often people will use um, uh, Seroquel or, um, uh, and or Cotiapine. Uh, someone's mentioned using Clozapine. Um, clozapine is uh, you know, more complicated to take, but it's, it's an excellent drug. There's the uh, Pimavanserin uh, that's out there. And I know there are other medications that are, are, are being used. Again, what I try to do is ramp up on the cognitive side, make sure the depression or anxiety are treated. I do the full mess uh, so that you, uh, you will feel less like that. But also it's, it's really about the, uh, the, the family uh, and helping them to cope and to be able to respond as calmly as they can um, so that, uh, that whenever there's more um, what we call expressed emotion or tension, in the home and uh, you know that so this is where taking care of yourself is so important that that extra tension kind of feeds on to the to the the person who has parkinson's disease who has less sort of um, ability perhaps to kind of cope and they need that structure of of another person to help support them and so we um and i i have a a, a good example of of um uh a uh, 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 husband and wife the husband had Parkinson's and and he also had uh, quite a bit of memory impairment and uh, and for many years his wife was you know she was really it was very difficult for her she was mourning the loss of her husband the person who she thought she'd be spending a different kind of year you know the golden years of her life with and and it was finally uh, at, at some point they were out um, uh, walking in, in uh, New Mexico and you know enjoying the uh, uh, the outdoors and. She began to um, sort of see the world through his eyes and what he was enjoying is she just was able to step back and be in the moment with him and, um, and enjoy the world as he could enjoy it. And it was a way for her to connect with him. Um, and, and that kind of connection and being with him also helped to calm him down and he felt less anxious. And it, it can be, um, it can take a while sometimes because there's, um, it, it's very, it was very magical actually, um, how that happened for her and how she felt better. Um, and then she saw that as sort of like a, a coping skill that she could use. It wasn't just a magical moment. It was like, Hey, this works. <laughs> and, uh, but I think that we all have to do those kinds of things. So you, you you talked about the isolation and how do you cope with these things and how do you connect with other people and knowing that there's always different kinds of connections that uh, we have that we need to, I don't want to say milk it for what it has, <laughs> because they're really, they're key to who we are as, as people. I want to give you one other story that I love to tell, because it's such a, a beautiful story of a patient we had who was, um, she had depression and she also was, uh, she had to be hospitalized. Uh, she did not want to have electroconvulsive therapy, which is a treatment we use for severe depression. So she stayed in the hospital uh, and after about six weeks or so, and she was almost, you know, she was in her late eighties. Um, and she eventually got better on medicine alone. She was taking bertazapine at doses that are way higher than I would give anyone else. Um, but she got better and, and she was this little tiny lady. And when she went home, she was the matriarch of this family and they had just had her great grandchild was born. And it turned out that she was the only one in the family who could get that colicky baby fall asleep because she had her tremor <laughs> sit there and hold that baby 
and it would just uh, it would uh, she was she was magical there and I, and the whole she was the uh, the the uh, still ruled the roost of that family and and the value of her being there and having made it through that you know terrible terrible depressive illness so I think that what I have learned from my my the people I've taken care of and their families is you know everyone has uh, something to offer and even when they're ill and uh and that and, and it's often is important sometimes first to you know get to look at yourself put your own oxygen mask on first whatever your stresses are and strains and whatever you're struggling with to come back to that and figure out what it is that you have and that you can uh, you can give to yourself or to others and then uh, and 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 then kind of build on that as a way to um, help cope with these conditions and that's not you know that's not about an antidepressant <laughs> so it's a, that's about the connections that we have with one another and to and to as I said milk those for for all that they give back to you and that you give to them absolutely. I mean, I think that this is such a complex, you know, that we, we've talked a little bit, Laura, about the mind and the body and, you know, the brain and all of these sort of things. And in Parkinson's, they can be intimately connected. So if you don't have, um, you know, if the mood is off, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, then the motor symptoms are automatically not going to be in a good place. And cognition is not going to be a good place. If sleep is off and then it leads to this whole cascade of all these other things, or if you're super isolated and you feel alone and you've withdrawn, all of these sorts of things can then kind of lead to, um, you know, a downward sort of spiral with some of these things. And in, in thinking about that in a positive way, though, if you can kick yourself into, you know, better sleep, better exercise, better social connection, better education and empowerment and feeling like you can, you're not alone and you can talk about these things to other people. I feel like hopefully we can make some, some changes that may, you know, then allow us to not necessarily need to be on huge amounts of pills for all of the above or, or, um, you know, some of these other interventions that may or may not be terribly helpful for all of these things. So hopefully we can, we can kind of revisit some of the things that we, we have control over a little bit and, in our everyday sort of lives. And I think, you know, some part of this conversation is also about finding meaning um, in ourselves and sort of not being so hard on ourselves. And that goes for caregivers as well. I think sometimes when we can kind of just sort of take a break from all the overwhelm and sort of just say, you know, what do I really enjoy? What do I take pleasure in? What, what is the moment that I really um, sort of take comfort in? And, you know, if it is, you know, something like sitting with the sun on your face and a, you know, a nice cup of tea and just a conversation with your neighbor, then do more of it. You know, I think there's, there's nothing that we can necessarily do to prescribe that in a pill for you. So. And I, I guess on the, uh, it's important when you're taking the antidepressants, what we do know is that uh, some, many times once someone does need them and they work, cause they're very effective. Uh, and so I don't want people not to take yeah. them. But yeah. you do both of them, because sometimes it's it's only when you get on enough of that antidepressant that you actually, it kind of gets you into the frame where you actually can carry out these things. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really are, and I think that one of the biggest problems we have is that people don't really think that, um, you know, whether it's you're being a psychiatrist, it's like people kind of think they equate, equate what I do with the tooth fairy, you know, like they don't believe in it. You know, and they don't believe in psychiatry. You don't say that about your cardiologist. I don't believe in cardiology. People, and so, but but what we do is we get people better, and and it is by by often with these medications as adjuncts to what we're doing. But you've got to have the whole mess um, as as part of that treatment. So I want to um, I, I want to emphasize that because um, I I think that that's what's so rewarding about taking care of of people as a physician is that you can you can kind of you know, uh, work that whole program. Um, absolutely. And yes, absolutely. So the message is that it's, you know, multi-prong approach. So often, you know, getting to the right doctors, identifying the problem, speaking about it and getting on the right sort of combination. Sometimes we're taking people off of pills, but often we're also putting people on. And I truly believe as a neurologist that, you know, um, some of these medications are life changing. Um, and sometimes, you know, before we even go on levodopa, sometimes we'll even change serotonin, um, you know, levels through an SSRI type medication. Um, and I think that, you know, Parkinson's medicines like Cinemet, uh, carbidopa, levodopa are hugely important too. So it's really, you know, the, the whole package. Mm -hmm. People are asking, everyone loves your mess. Uh, I think this is 
<laughs> it's going to be the take home, the take home message of the day, I think. Um, maybe we can speak. I, I think we have um, four minutes. We might not have time to speak on um, the uh, um, impulse control stuff, but I think okay, right, 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 in another right. episode, but maybe the last um, few minutes, um, Laura, we can talk a little bit about, I've asked a lot of um, different folks on this, um, you know, a little bit about this. Um, what is your sense of what the secret sauce is for a patient that is successful in, in sort of how they do with Parkinson's? If you take two people and they're identical, let's say, and one yeah, has yeah. secret sauce, who, how, 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 who is that person? And, and what, what is it that, that, that you've noticed is, is sort of uh, leads to success in this disease? Yes. Uh, was, I, I think some of them are on this call. I've known some of them over the years and, and, uh, uh, that I think about, um, the, the challenges that they face. Um, um, the first is when you're not having uh, um, any problems and you're coping pretty well, the, the first of that is to, uh, is to know that, you know, a lot may be expected of you. Uh, and, and that's a good place to be, but it, it may not be there forever. So it, and it may not be just that you have done something better than others. Um, so um, one is, is that, but there are people out there who I refer to as sort of the unscathed, and, and those are people who, for whatever reason, they just don't get any of these psychiatric problems and, and they really haven't done anything any better. They just seem to be lucky. Um, so, so that's one. And, and um, the, the secret sauce, um, I think it's, it's um, I, I, oh, um, I would go back to the, the, the folks who I have taken care of when they are feeling better after they've been treated, uh, they'll say, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, um, I can cope with Parkinson's, they would say, but not when I am overly anxious, you know, when my anxiety disorder is, is at, you know, looming, looming large, uh, anxiety disorders are largely treated with psychotherapy. Remember that, um, depression often treated with a combination of psychotherapy plus depression, plus antidepressants. And, and then when they have, you know, the other kinds of problems, they, they need the, the full mess, but I can cope with Parkinson's, but not when I have this psychiatric problem and that they, when they have used the MESS, they are connecting to other people. They're getting help from support groups. They're learning about their condition. They're constantly getting educated. Um, right. Um, all kinds of things uh, 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 that are, important and being willing to use the right coping strategy at the right time. So I have found that the people who want to fight their Parkinson's and they keep reading about it and finding out about it and that they think that if they just fight it hard enough, they're going to, they're, what they're really fighting is to not have the Parkinson's at all. That's not really the right coping strategy because they're still going to have the Parkinson's. So you have to make sure that there are certain things like uh, there's passive coping strategies and active coping strategies. So you want to make sure that if it's something that you can change, if it's something that you have control over, like your breathing, we all have control over that, that then you work on what you can change or control, but don't try to um, use an active coping strategy for something that you can't actually change. Um, so that would be probably the most important uh, 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 kind of guiding uh, concept that I would say, um, use, use an active coping strategy for active issues. Like if you're having, when you first have Parkinson's, make sure you're walking more, but if, once you start having balance problems and it's really not something getting up and walking and insisting that you're going to walk without an assisted advice is not a really good strategy. So that would be an example of that. Okay. So it sounds like engaging psychiatry and other folks when you need it and being yeah. open to the possibility of taking treatment if that's what is indicated, using the MESS strategies um, for things, uh, sort of life skills along the way, um, getting support, um, figuring out how to um, get education and uh, these skills learning the coping skills that are needed. And that could be through um, working with a psychologist or other folks in a support group and things like that. Those are sort 75 of- 75% of mess is what you do on your own. Yeah. Uh, it's the M is, <laughs> we just problem solve. So I think that it's, there's so much that people can do. And, and I think that the ones who uh, have done well are the ones who are constantly discovering and finding new things. And then they come back and they tell you about what they've learned. And then they, uh, um, 
uh, uh, come come back. So uh, and and so I've learned more about coping from individuals with Parkinson's than I have from any book I've ever read. So my you know the people I've taken care of are my best educators. So. Yeah, absolutely. We're all learning, it seems like. So, um, So, well, thank you so much, Laura, for spending the time today. Um, this was just such a, a fabulous sort of discussion. And um, thank you for all the amazing educational work that you've done and you continue to do for our veterans and, and helping us to train clinicians that we're all, um, you know, sort of uh, reaping the rewards from uh, worldwide. So, um, and I look forward to learning more from you. Thanks so much. I'll pass this back to thank Andrea um, <laughs> to, for our final wave goodbye. We always close with a wave of gratitude for our uh, all the content and ideas and for both of you for sharing your time. So I invite everyone to turn on their camera and just send some smiles through the airwaves. If you scroll through Dr. Marsh, you'll see all of the people. So I am grateful. <laughs> <laughs> thank great. you. So I thank you to everyone. all of you today. Great questions. Thanks for being here. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks.